Hi, and welcome back. We're looking at the Rockruppel Comp 2 compressor today from Process Audio. I'm not very confident I've pronounced that name correctly, so I'll probably just call it Comp 2 for the rest of the video. Some of you may be thinking, yawn, another very new compressor. Haven't we got this covered by now? Is this really worth a video? To which I would respond, are you mad? It's a new compressor plugin. Of course, it's worth looking at. Because while I'm of the opinion that most equalizers are pretty interchangeable if you can match the settings properly, no two compressors behave the same way. And much like distortion, even the bad examples can sound good in the right context. I'm not expecting a bad example here though. The plugin claims to do very Mew style tube powered compression, so I'm expecting to find a very gentle soft knee and a musical rather than surgical character. But the blurb also promises a wide range of attack and release times, and specifically the ability to go much faster than classic very Mew designs like the Fairchild, so perhaps it can get brutal when pushed hard. A quick chat about the interface. This is freely resizable, which is great, and is a pleasing combination of traditional and modern, with these optional scrolling gain and level graphs at the bottom. The style reminds me a little of the 1178 compressor plugin from Pulsar, and it appeals to me a lot, apart from this slightly tacky swinging rope lady on the VU meters. I thought they'd missed a trick initially. One of these meters could have featured a buff guy in a mankini, right? For some equal opportunity objectification. They're one step ahead of me, however. You can swap the meter images for a guy instead. Bravo. Now, why not an option for one in each meter? I'll be honest, I think I'm going to stick with the logo so I can read the numbers more easily. While we're talking about the interface, let's deal with this console feature at the top. This pops open a sidecar panel with little mini versions of every instance of Comp2 in the project. This certainly looks cool. I'm not sure I entirely agree with the choice of controls provided, but the thing about the basic essential compressor controls is they're all basic and essential. I think whatever subset of controls you provided here, you would still regularly need one that wasn't provided. Fortunately, you can click to swap the main interface panel to show the full set of controls for any of the other instances. This seems like potentially a much more useful option, but it's one I will probably have to live with for a while to see if it actually helps in practice. Anyway, kind of the first thing that caught my eye was this amp-only switch at the top. This strongly suggests some non-linearities separate from the compression. Let's try that first. The only way to drive it harder seems to be old school, cranks the input gain. But fortunately, we can inverse link the output gain so we hear the change in sound properly. And sure enough, it gets noticeably crunchy when the input gain is maxed. It's still relatively mild though, meaning we have lots of control over subtler, more subliminal settings. And these do seem to provide a useful extra brightness and shine on these drums. The transformer option is subtle, which is as it should be really. Interestingly, I hear more of a difference from this with the input gain set lower than I do with it cranked. And yes, by the way, we do have oversampling available. It's linear phase, appears to work as it should, and the plugin's CPU use is still quite reasonable, even at the highest setting. Okay, so let's turn the compressor back on and dial in some squash. A few things to note here. The threshold works backwards, so you turn it up to reduce the threshold and apply more gain reduction. I'm okay with that, personally. The threshold knob is just calibrated 0 to 10 rather than in decibels. I'm less okay with that, but I'll come back to it shortly. And there's no ratio control. The threshold is the only way to control how much gain reduction you're applying. Those last two things didn't initially surprise me that much, 
Very Mu style compressors typically have a transfer curve that transitions smoothly from very gentle compression up to almost limiting over quite a wide range, so it's hard to identify a specific threshold, and you get the ratio you want by riding different parts of the transfer curve. But in use, that doesn't really seem to be the case. In fact, there seems to be a fairly definite biting point for the compressor on these drums. Checking the transfer in Plugin Doctor confirms that we don't really have that typical very mu curve at all. There is some softness to the knee, but also still a fairly definite threshold, and the ratio seems to settle down to a fairly constant gradient of around 3 to 1 above that. I don't have a problem with the knee being harder than other very mu designs, this is just different, neither inherently better or worse. But it does make me wish for a ratio control. Perhaps there are technical reasons why real very mu compressors can't do that, but this is a plug-in, I'm sure it can be done. If you're thinking, well you've got a dry wet mix knob, isn't that good enough? First of all, this can't increase the effective ratio, only decrease it. And when it does decrease it, it also changes the shape of the transfer curve, and of the attack and release curves. Adjusting the threshold, by contrast, changes when the compression happens. Different parts of the signal will cross the threshold, so the compression changes as well as increases or decreases. The only way to get more or less of the exact same compression is to adjust a ratio control, so I kind of miss having one here. Note that the only available makeup gain is the output knob, so I've had to unlink it from the input gain to compensate for the compression. If I turn linking back on, the relative gains are now preserved, which is nice. But note that we now have no way to control the saturation independently from the compression. Boosting the input gain will drive both harder. And because the threshold isn't calibrated in decibels, you can't just simply match the input gain change to get the compression back where it was. You'll have to use your ears and the gain reduction meters to get close enough. This also means you can't easily bypass the compression to hear the saturation only. If I switch to amp only, I still have the makeup gain I dialed in for the compression, so now it's much too loud. Slightly surprisingly these days, we also seem to be missing any A-B switching options to make it easier to compare settings, which would have helped with this issue somewhat. Here's how I'd change things if it were up to me. I would add a total of three extra parameters. First of all, a headroom control, like the one in the oven from Plugin Alliance, which would reduce the headroom and make it distort more at lower levels. The audible effect should be identical to driving the input harder with the output linked, except without affecting the gain of the signal hitting the compressor. Second, a dedicated compressor makeup gain, which is bypassed along with the compression in amp only mode. Neither of those options would change the sound at all, so arguments that it's not faithful to the hardware don't really apply. They would simply make it easier and faster to dial in your settings. My third suggestion is perhaps more controversial, add a ratio control. I can deal with the authenticity arguments by simply pointing out the external sidechain option. I don't actually know if that's an option on the hardware, I'm guessing not because the button is down on the bottom bar instead of being a switch on the main interface. Anyway, if it's not an option on the hardware, well then clearly it's okay to add potentially sound changing features to the plugin, right? And if it is an option, well, then it is actually possible to get higher ratios from the hardware, assuming you have two of them. Run them in series, but with the side chains in parallel. If the second instance has the exact same settings as the first, I've linked them in Reaper so I can still tweak them easily, and also the exact same signal hitting the side chain, it will behave exactly the same way as the first compressor, and just add a second helping of the exact same gain reduction. So that roughly 3 to 1 compression becomes roughly 6 to 1 compression, which sounds like this. That's a pretty cool sound, right? Reality check, let's bypass both instances 
can hear the uncompressed drums again. Now, truth be told, this is heavier, higher ratio compression than I would usually use on a drum bus. This kind of setting would sound great on the drum room mics. But for the drum bus, I typically prefer lower ratios, like 2 to 1 or even less. I guess there's no way to do this that's authentic to the hardware, other than with the dry-wet mix knob, which we've already established isn't the same thing. Well, in fact, there is, assuming those external sidechain inputs again. I'm going to use two instances with linked controls once again. But this time, the first instance is only processing the sidechain of the second instance. So the second instance sees a signal with already reduced dynamics and reacts less aggressively as a result. This doesn't reduce the ratio as perfectly as my earlier trick increased it. The ballistics of the first compressor will subtly affect the behaviour of the second, so the compression will probably also change in character somewhat, but often in a good way, in my opinion. In fact, I've made a whole video about this trick, link in the description. Anyway, let's listen to some gentle, low ratio compression on these drums, with the threshold set lower to dig deeper into the dynamic range. That is, in my opinion, a really awesomely useful drum bus setting. And I suspect it would also work well on other buses too. For reference, if I switch the second instance back to its internal side chain, we can compare to the default roughly 3 to 1 ratio. Also note that if I turn down the dry wet mix for the first instance that's processing the side chain, the second instance is now hearing the same signal it's processing, so we're back to the normal 3 to 1 compression again. Which means we can dial in a halfway house. But I've covered these tricks in other videos, so I won't let myself get too sidetracked here. Anyway, if you balk at the idea of adding a ratio knob that would be impossible in the hardware, how about just a switch with two extra options? A limiter mode, which just applies the same gain reduction twice, like in my first trick. And a gentle mode, which pre-compresses the sidechain with the same compression settings, apart from makeup gain, like my second trick. Anyway, back to just one instance. Let's try the attack control. This does go pretty fast. We're eating the initial transient quite effectively with the fastest setting. The other extreme isn't as slow as I was expecting, however. We're into thumpy territory for the initial transients, but nowhere near slow enough to start ignoring the transients entirely, which with some compressors will happen for the entire upper half of the attack control. Again, I'm okay with this, however, as most useful settings are in the range provided here. And I'm also okay with the stepped control. The gradations are fine enough that I'll probably always be able to get it where I want it, while the steps help you to not be too precious about it. Okay then, release. Again, this goes really fast. And it's starting to audibly distort now. Especially if I match it with the fastest attack. But the other extreme is actually rather slow and gentle. I quite like the wide range of control here, but it means that the stepped control is more problematic. Listen to the difference between this release setting and this just one notch faster. That's a big difference, right? I can certainly imagine wanting to land somewhere in between those two settings, and I think I would prefer a continuous knob here 
or at least finer steps. There's also a high pass filter for the side chain. This has the expected effect. We're hardly touching the kick drum now. There's a pretty big difference between this filter setting and filter off, suggesting that it's a relatively steep filter. But strangely, I can't find any way to listen to the side chain in such a way that I can hear the filter directly. Yes, I did try the button at the bottom. This only appears to apply to the external side chain. Let's talk about the stereo options. And as these make it much more likely that I'll use this on buses, let's use a full stereo mix instead of just drums. We've been running in stereo mode so far, which links the left and right channel controls and also the left and right gain reduction to prevent the stereo image wandering. We also have options labeled dual mono and mid side. And selecting these gives us some more listen options. Are these the side chain listen options I was looking for? No, they're not. They allow you to listen to the mid or side channels in isolation, but the compression is still in place and you still don't get to hear the side chain filter directly. Anyway, let's talk about dual mono first. Actually, true dual mono behavior is kind of redundant in a plugin. No one is going to bother routing two separate mono signals through one instance, as they might with hardware. They'll just load another instance instead. But that's okay, because in fact, what this option really means is unlinked gain reduction. There's a separate option to link or unlink the controls. Different compression settings for the left and right channels of a stereo signal is not something I ever do myself. But maybe I'm missing a trick, so I guess it's good to have the option. But stereo compression with unlinked gain reduction is something I do very often. So dual mono with linked controls is a useful configuration. I recently got a question about that. Perhaps you won't mind if I get distracted slightly and answer it. Why did I have my mix bus compressor unlinked? Surely that would mess up the stereo image. The answer comes in two parts. First of all, that compressor was only doing about 1 dB of gain reduction. And furthermore, the mix elements that hit the compressor hardest are mostly center panned, like the kick and snare. So the left-right gain reduction is still highly correlated, even with the compressor unlinked. The actual gain differences between the channels will only ever be a small fraction of that total 1 dB gain reduction. So the effect on the stereo image is unlikely to be very severe. That doesn't entirely answer the question though. Okay, so it's a minor issue, but why not link the compression and avoid it entirely? So we need part two of the answer, which is more complicated. Basically, there are two different ways to create stereo width. You can do it with level differences between the channels by adjusting the pan pot, for example. Or you can create width using phase differences, like, for example, using Haas delay tricks, where one channel is delayed slightly. A stereo recording made using a coincident XY or MS mic pair will have level differences between the channels, but no real phase differences. But if you use the spaced AB pair, you'll have some small level differences, but a ton of phase differences as signals arrive at the two mics at different times. There are also halfway house mic arrays, such as ORTF and NOS, where directional microphones are placed at angles to one another, and also a small distance apart, to capture mostly level differences with a little bit of phase difference as well. Qualitatively, the two types of stereo are very different. Level differences between channels allow you to place a signal at a very specific place in the stereo image. If I pan my voice 50% left, you can hear that very clearly, and can probably hear the difference when I bring it back to only 30% left. But the stereo image you create is a little flat and two-dimensional. By contrast, if I delay the right channel of my voice slightly, it now seems to come from the left again, but in a much more vague and non-specific way. You can't pinpoint the location this time. And you probably can't tell much difference if I change the delay time, unless you're listening in mono, in which case you would hear the comb filtering shift to different frequencies. Yes, this type of stereo can cause mono compatibility problems, but you can manage those with a little care, and it's often worth the effort because phase differences can create a glorious sense of space and depth, utterly unlike level differences. <laughs>
So let's think about how those two types of stereo will be affected by an unlinked compressor. If you're relying on level differences to create the stereo image, then obviously unlinked compression is going to fight against that. Anything that's panned left or right will hit the compressor harder on that side and will be pushed back towards the centre. The part will wander around in the stereo image and the overall width will be reduced. This is probably never desirable. Now let's consider phase differences. These only ever provide a vague sense of direction, so nothing will seem to wander around the stereo image if your gain reduction is unlinked. However, reducing the level differences between channels will tend to exaggerate the phase differences, so unlinked compression will, if anything, make it seem wider and more spacious. Sometimes it's obvious what type of stereo you're dealing with and how your compressor should be linked. If I'm compressing a spaced pair of drum room mics, that will definitely be unlinked, because this is all about those spacious phase differences. But if I've chosen to use an XY or MS pair for the overheads, that will be because I want to be able to place each drum and cymbal precisely in the stereo image, and my compression will be linked so I don't mess that up. But actually, most of the time, stereo signals contain some mixture of both types of stereo. The drum bus, in that example, will be a mixture of level differences from the coincidental overheads and panned spot mics, plus phase differences from the room mics. And by the time we get to the mix bus, we've probably got a very complex mixture of both. Even if every source in your mix is simple pan-potted mono, any reverb you added will rely on phase difference to create a sense of space and you'll still end up with a mixture of both types. So when you're compressing a stereo signal, ask yourself what's your priority. Do you want to preserve the precise placement of the parts in the stereo image? In that case, link your channels. Or do you want to enhance the general feeling of space and depth? In that case, unlink your channels. Or if you like, just listen to them both and pick whichever sounds better. Just remember that, contrary to what you may have been taught, there isn't one correct way to do this. Both options are correct for different reasons. And indeed, sometimes you might not be able to decide which you prefer. In that case, if I were using something like Pro C2, I might end up with a partial linking setting. That's not an option with Comp2, but I'm not going to criticize it for that. If I don't have a preference, I'll usually just go unlinked, because that sense of space usually matters more to me than precise placement in the stereo field. All right then, let's talk about mid-side compression. Again, we have the option to link the controls, but this is much less useful in this case. Usually the side channel is significantly lower in level than the mid-channel, so this will just mean you're applying much more gain reduction for the mid-channel. Much more useful to consider the M and S compression totally separately. So let's talk about compressing just the mid-channel. Obviously, this is much less likely to cause any wandering in the stereo field than unlinked stereo compression. When the gain is reduced for just the mid-channel, the effect is to widen the stereo image, which might make panned elements become slightly harder panned, but the effect is very subtle and never normally a problem. In practice, compressing the mid-channel only is very much the same as compressing in stereo, but sometimes with a more natural sense of space, as the ambience in the side channel isn't affected. Over a full mix, this can sometimes provide the glue that you wanted, but without any reduced sense of air and space. It's a very useful option that makes me a lot more likely to use this on buses. Okay, on to side channel compression. And in fact, there are two potentially useful ways to set this up, but only one of them is available here, unless you resort to some trickery again. So, Let's resort to some trickery. I've switched to the sidechain input again, but I've sent the sidechain a mono version of the signal panned hard left. That means the mid and side channels of the sidechain are identical. And actually, if I link the controls to apply the same settings to both channels, we're effectively back to simple stereo compression. Mid and side channels always have the same gain now, so the result is identical to modulating the left and right channels instead. So this is kind of pointless, and the only reason to set this up is to have different settings for the sides. Let's bypass the mid compression entirely 
And now we have the side channel modulated by the dynamics of the mid channel. A typical use case for this would be to make your centrally panned kick and snare hits a bit drier by ducking down the ambience in the side channel whenever they hit, but allowing that ambience to ride back up in between hits to maintain the sense of space. However, without the side chain trickery, our only option is to modulate the side channel with its own dynamics. Or in other words, just compress the side channel. This is also potentially useful, but in a completely different way. You can think of it as microdynamic control of your stereo width. Try compressing the side channel good and hard with a nice fast release to bring up all the ambience quickly. And obviously a suitable amount of makeup gain and you can create an impressively wide and consistent soundstage. Not what I would call a natural effect, but it can be very effective when you want dramatic, larger than life width and depth. And of course you can, if you want, also apply some glue to the mid channel at the same time. I have to say though, while I'm liking the three to one ratio for the side channel, it's a higher ratio than I would usually use for gluing duties. I kind of wish I could have that lower ratio I hacked earlier on. Well, no problem. I'm going to run two instances again, with the first just processing the side chain for the second. Both are running in mid-side mode, and I've linked the controls for the mid-channel. But the side channel for the first instance is set all dry, so this instance is only compressing the mid-channel. The second instance is listening to the external sidechain, which is the output of the first compressor. So the mid-channel is pre-compressed in the sidechain, giving me that delightfully low ratio gluey compression setting for the mid-channel, while the side-channel is still doing that harder 3 to 1 compression, just the same as before. I have to say, this is some pretty awesome sounding bus compression, but we have had to work a little to get there. So I'm going to sum it up. This is a nice looking and nice sounding compressor plugin, somewhat more versatile than most very new designs, and which doesn't really belong in the same category as your Fairchild emulations. It's a usable and useful plugin, but with, in my opinion, the potential to become much more useful and usable if the developer had the courage to add some more features that the hardware couldn't do. After all, if it's okay to add a scrolling graph, I assume the hardware doesn't do that, and gain and control linking options, these both acknowledge that a plugin has different capabilities and constraints compared to a hardware unit. To be clear, I'm absolutely not opposed to modeling analog hardware and creating plug-in emulations. If there's an interesting and unique flavor of compression in that analog box, then you bet I want a convenient and affordable digital version of that. But I also want all the advantages of digital at the same time. I don't know enough about the electronics to say if adding a ratio control to a real Varimu compressor is actually impossible or not. But I'm pretty confident it is possible in the plug-in version and it would make it about 500% more useful. Indeed, if an update to this plugin added to that ratio control, this would probably become one of my favorite bus compressors. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching.